Good afternoon, and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Angela Greiling Keen. I'm a reporter for Bloomberg News, and I'm the 106th president of the National Press Club. We are the world's leading professional organization for journalists, committed to our profession's future through programming with events such as this, while fostering a free press worldwide. For more information about the Press Club, please visit our website at press.org to donate to programs offered through our National Press Club Journalism Institute to the public, please visit www.press.org backslash institute. On behalf of our members worldwide, I'd like to welcome our speaker and those of you in our audience today. Our head table includes guests of our speaker as well as working journalists who are club members. If you hear applause in our audience today, we'd note that members of the general public are also attending, so it's not necessarily evidence of a lack of journalistic objectivity. I'd like to welcome our C-SPAN and public radio audiences as well. Our luncheons are featured on our weekly member-produced podcast from the National Press Club, available on iTunes. You can follow the action today on Twitter using the hashtag NPCLunch. After our guest speech concludes, we'll have question and answer period. I will ask as many questions as time permits. Now it's time to introduce our head table guests. I'd ask each of you to stand up briefly as your name is announced. From your right, Devin Henry, Washington correspondent for MinPost, Amy Morris, Morning Drive anchor for WNEW Radio, CBS's DC affiliate, Jessica Zygmunt, Washington bureau chief for Modern Healthcare, Marlene Malik, President, Friends of Cancer Research, Deidre Henderson, a program officer with the Roundtable on Value and Science Driven Healthcare at the Institute of Medicine, His Excellency. Rodolf Bakink of the Netherlands. Skipping over the podium, and Matt Malnarczyk, President of the Advocatus Group and the Speakers Committee member who organized today's event. Thank you, Matt. Skipping over our speaker for a moment, Michael Powell, a Mayo Clinic trustee, a former FCC chairman, and currently the head of the National Cable and Telecommunication Association. Carolyn Block, Editor with, the, with Federal Telemedicine News. Cynthia Carter, President and CEO, FDA News. And Brenda Crane, Director, Media and Editorial for the American Medical Association. <laughs> Our guest today runs a place with such name recognition that it's known simply as The Clinic. The Mayo Clinic is a not-for-profit healthcare system dedicated to medical care, research, and education. The clinic has more than 61,000 employees, operates in six states, and is based in the city of Rochester in the great state of Minnesota. Every year, more than a million people from every state in the U.S. and nearly 150 countries come to the Mayo Clinic to receive care. Dr. John H. Noseworthy is its president and chief executive officer. Dr. Noseworthy joined the Mayo Clinic in 1990. Prior to his current appointment, he served as Chairman of the Department of Neurology, Medical Director of the Department of Development, and Vice Chairman of the Mayo Clinic Rochester Executive Board. He is also a professor in the Department of Neurology and continues to practice medicine and consult with patients. His specialty is multiple sclerosis, and he has spent more than two decades designing and conducting controlled clinical trials. Dr. Noseworthy also is the author of more than 150 research papers, chapters, editorials, and several books. He has served as editor-in-chief for Neurology, the official journal of the American Academy of Neurology. Born in Melrose, Massachusetts, Dr. Noseworthy received his medical degree from Dalhousie University in Canada. Peers say he has an excellent understanding of differing healthcare delivery systems and priorities because he has lived in both Canada and the United States. And they also say that as the son of a minister, he has developed values that are altruistic and highly ethical. During his tenure as CEO, Dr. Noseworthy and his leadership team developed a strategic plan designed to ensure the Mayo Clinic remains a trusted resource for patients amid a rapidly changing healthcare environment. The goal is to extend the clinic's mission to serve new populations, providing care through more efficient delivery and increasing the personalization and immediacy of healthcare for all people. In Minnesota, the clinic's plans raised eyebrows when they announced they were 
going to ask for infrastructure funding and ask the state to help out with $585 million of taxpayer money. The idea is that the infrastructure will benefit the facilities and help bring more revenue to the state as it conveys more patients. The clinic argues that enhancements will bring more revenue and it's entitled to some of the money in return. Despite the eye-popping number in a state that struggled with finances in recent years, the plan has won endorsement of much in the Minnesota media and the support of Rochester lawmakers. The clinic is also accelerating the transition of research in patient care and was the first facility approved by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration to produce and administer choline C11 injections, which help detect recurrent prostate cancer earlier, providing patients with more immediate access to new individualized and targeted treatments. The Mayo Clinic reported annual revenue of $8.8 .8 in 2012, with expenses rising 9.6% to $8.4 billion. Dr. Noseworthy has said he expects the clinic to receive 20 to 40 percent less revenue for its services over the next five years due to the aging population and cost of Medicare, a challenging economy, a change in pension plans, and health care reform. With that in mind, the Mayo Clinic is trying to redesign its practice to create a higher quality of care at lower costs. Today, Dr. Noseworthy will share his thoughts on how to create such a system in a speech titled, Three Imperatives to Transform Healthcare in America. Please join me in giving a warm National Press Club welcome to Dr. John Noseworthy. Thank you, Angela, for the invitation to address members of the National Press Club, <clears throat> excuse me, Senator Amy Klobuchar, members of Women Heart and the Lynx Incorporated, His Excellency Rudolf Baking and Gabriel de Kuyper Baking of the Netherlands, Mayo Clinic Trustee Michael Powell, Marlene Malik, President of Friends of Cancer Research, representatives of the European Union and the embassies of Belgium and Germany, distinguished friends and colleagues. I come here today as the president and CEO of Mayo Clinic. Each year, more than a million patients come from 50 states and last year, 137 countries to Mayo Clinic seeking hope and solutions. Our unique and distinguishing characteristic is the Mayo Clinic model of care, a trusted and collaborative approach to medicine that is complemented by a constant quest for knowledge and innovation and dates back to the founding of the clinic 149 years ago. Medical research and education have been core to our mission from the very start. Today, the spirit of the clinic is brought to life through work with groups like Women Heart, the National Coalition for Women with Heart Disease, and the Lynx Incorporated, and their impactful efforts to empower and engage patients. Our more than 50,000 physicians, scientists, and allied health staff are our most precious resource. They're a unified team linked by a singular primary value. The needs of the patient come first. Our staff's relentless and unwavering commitment to excellence spawned healthcare innovation across three centuries. The first to adopt a unified medical record in 1907, a stunning innovation that has now been embraced by almost two-thirds of practices in this country. The nation's first and largest multidisciplinary academic medical group practice. The first microscopic system for grading cancer. The Nobel Prize for cortisone. The invention of the heart-lung machine and countless more. Every day our staff do pioneering work in surgery, in the COGOD Center on Aging, the Mayo Clinic Cancer Center, and across all medical specialties. We're leaders in applying the tools of social media to patient care and clinical research. As a humanitarian not-for-profit healthcare organization, our commitment is to discover, interpret, and share knowledge to create exceptional affordable health care for people everywhere. We believe that learnings from the Mayo model of care 
deeply rooted in innovation can and should be broadly applied as healthcare in America faces perhaps the most profound challenge in our history. We have something to offer America and we're committed to sharing it. The Affordable Care Act, or ACA, signed into law three years ago, was the largest health care reform package in nearly 50 years. While the ACA provides insurance to millions of uninsured Americans, profound challenges remain. We have an aging population with a growing number of seniors with multiple health problems, fragmented care with patients struggling to know where to turn, rising health care costs that now total nearly 18% of our GDP. These challenges pose real and significant threats to American families and the economic health of the United States. Families struggle to pay their bills. Businesses struggle to remain competitive. The United States desperately needs innovation that addresses our most pressing problems. Uneven health care quality, skyrocketing costs, and the lack of tools to help us spend wisely when it comes to health care. Today I'll outline three imperatives to transform health care in America by creating higher quality, patient-centered care at lower cost. The first imperative, put proven knowledge into practice quickly and consistently to benefit patients. Deliver knowledge. Imperative two, embrace the need for value. Create high quality care at lower cost. Create value. And for the government, imperative three, fund discovery science, innovation, and fund excellence in patient care. Fund excellence. The first imperative, deliver knowledge. We need to put proven knowledge into practice quickly and consistently. Americans expect and deserve contemporary health care. They should reap the benefits of the research they support through their tax dollars. Government funding of NIH and other agencies play a critical role in generating much of the new knowledge that can help patients. And I'll return to this in a moment when discussing the third imperative. The challenge is to quickly and consistently push proven discoveries into everyday medical practice so patients benefit. This is much more easily said than done. For example, after researchers discovered that beta blockers benefit patients after heart attacks, it took 25 years for that practice to spread widely through medicine. Why does it take so long? It's in large part because we're inundated with new knowledge. More than 1.5 million journal articles are published annually, and there's no central mechanism for synthesizing and applying this key information. At Mayo Clinic, we have challenged ourselves. Every patient at every Mayo Clinic location will receive the highest value Mayo Clinic and the best and brightest in healthcare from around the world collectively know how to provide every patient. We've invested in three centers to press forward in some of the most exciting frontiers of medicine, individualized medicine, regenerative medicine, and the science of healthcare delivery. We have developed one of the largest electronic medical record systems in the world. Everything related to patient's care is immediately available to Mayo, Mayo caregivers and their patients. And because most of our local patients allow their records to be used in medical research, we and our partners have been able to build the NIH-funded Rochester Epidemiology Project, making Olmsted, Minnesota one of the few places on the globe where research, researchers can study diseases, their causes and treatments, in a defined geographic population. We have come to realize that Mayo's most scalable product is our knowledge, both what works and what we know about how to deliver what we know to our patients. 
We are creating a knowledge content management system, an electronic book of Mayo vetted knowledge about best practice protocols, hospital orders, patient and education materials, as well as information for the public and potential business customers. What does that mean for our patients? It means safer care, better outcomes, fewer redundancies, and cost savings. New information is added constantly. We maintain a portfolio of our consensus knowledge and recommendations in a tool called Ask Mayo Expert. This provides answers and enables physicians to deliver safe, integrated, highest quality care. Through our electronic systems, this knowledge can be updated once and made available anywhere. This striking innovation allows us to share what we know with others who want to partner with Mayo Clinic to provide better care to their patients. This commitment to deliver knowledge is the basis of our strategy in this era of health care consolidation. Consolidation of hospital systems and payers that you've heard so much about. Mayo Clinic has chosen a different path than many others in the industry. We're pursuing a business model based on knowledge management and diffusion of knowledge as an integration tool rather than consolidation, mergers and acquisitions of assets because this is our most scalable asset is what we know and we believe this will help provide better care to patients. The important next step is sharing that knowledge more broadly through accessible tools promoting integrated care by providing doctors and nurses organized as teams with the information that they need to care for patients. With our rapidly growing non-owned affiliate practice network, the Mayo Clinic Care Network, we identify high quality practices across the country and internationally who share common practice, pardon me, common patient-centered values and would like to partner with us to provide better care to their patients locally by using our knowledge sets to enhance the quality of their practice. To enable teams of doctors and nurses to provide better care to their patients in Montana, Illinois, Missouri, Michigan, Kentucky, Puerto Rico, and on and on. With our help, to call upon us with electronic consultations or referrals as necessary to come and see us if they feel that is best. Fifteen of the highest quality healthcare organizations in the country have joined the network since its creation in 2011, and we expect that number to double in the next 18 months. Deliver knowledge. As fast as it is known to support healthcare professionals in their communities and provide better care locally at lower cost. This is what we're doing. Integration of care, not consolidation, not mergers and acquisitions. Integration for our patients. Imperative two, create value. We need to embrace the elusive goal of value, higher quality at lower cost. Each of us as patients have different health care needs throughout our lives. We all experience a spectrum of care, a spectrum of care. Most of the time, we need primary care. Usually we're healthy, we need preventive services, we have one or two manageable chronic illnesses, require immunizations or antibiotics, and can be helped by primary care physicians, community internists, pediatricians, and nurses often using best practice protocols tailored as needed to meet our needs. And that makes up a large part of the spectrum of care. At other times, however, we may suffer a heart attack or need knee replacement or gallbladder surgery. That requires intermediate care, another part of the spectrum of care. And that may be delivered at a hospital with special expertise. Finally, a small percentage of us each year, perhaps one in a thousand, 
will need complex care because we've become very sick. Perhaps we can't get an accurate diagnosis or require complex care from a team of specialists or need cutting edge therapies. We move to the portion of the spectrum of care where the needs and services and the expertise provide the best care for us. And in this situation, the most complex part of the spectrum. And then when our needs are met with either intermediate or complex care, we move rapidly back to the primary care where we can be cared for very well by our, by our own physicians. And most of us will move across the spectrum throughout our lives and especially as we age. The ACA takes important steps to improve primary care, but more, more work is needed to create and ensure high quality across this spectrum of care for all Americans. Recognition that there is a spectrum of care is a first step toward true payment reform. Without recognition of the spectrum of care, it will be impossible to accomplish high value care delivery linked to value-based payment reform. As physicians and allied health staff manage the health of a population, they are responsible for helping patients to navigate the spectrum of care to receive the highest quality of care delivered most cost-effectively. That's value-based delivery. With value as the highest common goal, healthcare professionals in all care settings can turn traditional thinking on its head and find better, more affordable ways to care for patients. Patients, providers, and taxpayers alike get into trouble when patients churn in the wrong part of the spectrum of care, when healthcare professionals fail to coordinate care and smooth the transition to the next level of care. Healthcare costs skyrocket with inappropriate and duplicate testing, and there may be poor quality and unsafe care. To understand what works and to advance the science of healthcare delivery, we need data, both on the desired outcomes of care across the spectrum and on the total cost of care over time. That's what makes the promise of Mayo Clinic's new strategic research alliance with Optum, a subsidiary of United Health Group, the world's largest insurance company, so exciting. This new entity, Optum Labs, brings together clinical and cost data that can provide a window into better outcomes as opposed to simply measuring the process of care and long-term cost. By analyzing both quality and cost, we create value. At the core of the potential is the vast reservoir of clinical and claims data, stripped, of course, of all personal identifying information to protect patient privacy, that these two founding partners of the Strategic Alliance possess. The Alliance brings together clinical data, health outcomes on 5 million Mayo Clinic patients with Optum's cost of care data on 109 million patients collected over two decades to answer this pressing question in healthcare, questions that up until now we've not been able to address. The potential for this open learning innovation lab, Optum Labs, is extraordinary, and the potential will be made even more remarkable when others join the alliance. Academic medical centers, research universities, pharmaceutical and device companies, policymakers, and other payers. This alliance will allow us to create a data-driven, transparent system to identify what works, how much does it cost, who's doing it best, it's a necessary springboard for future innovation to drive up the quality of the care that we give and drive down the costs of health care. As results are known and broadly shared, patients, providers, and payers can seek and reward those who are providing the highest value. Some have told us that they believe this alliance holds the potential to change everything in health care and we would not disagree. 
This alliance will accelerate the creation of value from a brisk walk to a sprinter's pace. There is much that Mayo Clinic and other health care providers can do to provide and deliver high quality affordable care, value based care across the health care spectrum, primary, intermediate, and complex care. At Mayo Clinic, we know we can do this. There's no trade off between improving quality and lowering cost. Indeed, higher productivity and lower cost result in higher patient satisfaction and safer care. We're committed to doing our part. It's in the cultural DNA of our organization. But we can't do it alone. What do we need the government to do? To realize the full potential of these two imperatives, these two innovations, delivering knowledge and creating value to transform healthcare, we need the third imperative, fund excellence. Imperative three, fund excellence. We must support scientific discovery and align pay payment mechanisms to reward excellence across the healthcare spectrum. Since we're in our nation's capital, I want to take this opportunity to ask the Congress and the White House to invest in innovation. <laughs> invest in innovation. Create a payment system that recognizes the different levels of care and rewards quality and value at each level and to overhaul Medicare's payment structure. First, fund innovation. As a nation, we're sliding off the top. For example, the U.S. has been falling against other developed nations in perhaps the most important measure of health care quality, life expectancy. We must reverse this trend. The NIH invested more than $30 billion on medical research in 2012, and Mayo Clinic received approximately $220 million of that. Funding for the NIH and other agencies is critical to research, scientific discovery, technology, engineering, and math to strengthen our economy. It must be preserved. Mayo Clinic has many partners in discovery, including generous benefactors, and public and private sector initiatives. Our partnerships include work with colleagues in the Netherlands to improve quality of life in aging, a European Union and Czech government finance project with St. Anne's Hospital in Bruno to develop the new International Clinical Research Center. We also learn much from the cutting edge work of others. Innovative startups like Rock Health, progressive insurers like Kaiser Permanente, and our colleagues at other fine academic medical centers like Harvard and Hopkins. Funding from NIH is central to healthcare's ability to advance medical science, to innovate and contribute to the nation's economy. Secondly, the financing of healthcare must be data driven. Government policies must, must help to create a competitive marketplace where data drives innovation and better care at lower cost for intermediate and complex care across the spectrum. This approach is reflected in the promise of our partnership with Optum, the marriage of clinical and insurance claim data to show how to achieve the best patient outcomes and the lowest cost on a large scale. We urge government to encourage and help drive collective and cooperative work in healthcare to understand what works best, especially for patients whose conditions require intermediate and complex care. We must learn from each other. If someone else does it better, we should do it that way as well. If we implement a data-driven model of financing healthcare, we can build a sustainable, value-based model of healthcare and create a competitive healthcare marketplace, competing with data on better outcomes at lower cost. Our nation and all of us as patients will win. Third, reimbursement must recognize and reward the spectrum of healthcare delivery across primary, intermediate, and complex care. We propose creating a payment system that acknowledges how our country uses healthcare, one that recognizes the different types of care and rewards the quality and value of each, whether primary, intermediate, or complex. The ACA addresses primary care by creating accountable care organizations 
with risk-adjusted global payments in shared services, pardon me, shared, shared savings. But most of us will need more than primary care at some point in our life, as I mentioned. Patients with complex conditions and even many needing intermediate care do not always fit into neat categories. Although these patients with intermediate and complex care may share some similarities with each other and may be grouped accordingly, often there are important individual characteristics that necessitate that they be treated as exceptions. Even in one of the most common intermediate procedures, knee replacement, patients may have one or more coexisting medical conditions or advanced age or previous surgery or an infected joint all of which contribute to the complexity of the case and need to be measured in terms of value and outcomes. When it comes to highly complex care, highly complex care, no two, type, no two patients are alike. Let me give you one example from a cardiologist dealing with two patients with blackouts. In the first, the blackouts were found to be due to neurocardiogenic syncope with focal epilepsy. In the second patient with blackouts, the autonomic nervous system was failing because the patient had a condition called multiple systems atrophy, a form of Parkinson's disease. Both of the patients had blackouts, but that's where the similarities ended. Aligning how we pay for care with how we diagnose and treat patients will appropriately reflect the meticulous medical de detective work that this doctor and her care or, and her team's care orchestrated. Within this part of the spectrum of care, data on desired outcomes must be used to create a sustainable continuum of care, and these outcome and cost metrics must be readily available so patients and families and payers can make informed decisions about where to seek care. Our health payment system must include incentives and rewards for the proper management of these complex cases. We believe payment reform must address the sustainable growth rate, the SGR, a complex formula that determines Medicare physician payments. SGR is broken. The original intent of the SGR was to make more, to more closely control the use of physician services and costs. However, every year since 2003, Congress has postponed the SGR update to physician payments, and this has accumulated to a potentially devastating 30% cut to physician payments. The next scheduled SGR payment will be in January, unless Congress acts this year. Left unchecked, its impact will be profound. At Mayo Clinic alone, it will mean a $128 million funding reduction in the first year to treat our Medicare patients and 55% of the patients that we care for at, Medicare, at Mayo Clinic are Medicare, 128 million in the first year. The SGR has not effectively controlled the volume of physician services. It does not distinguish between doctors who provide high quality care to beneficiaries and those who provide unnecessary services. Physicians who provide the most efficient care are penalized under Medicare's current payment system while physicians who order more tests or perform more procedures are paid more. After a decade of temporary fixes, Congress must seek a permanent solution to the SGR. And we recommend repeal the SGR, create a one to three year transitional reimbursement system at the Consumer Price Index, and establish new negotiated payment models that tie reimbursement to patient-centered care and quality outcomes along the spectrum of care, as I've mentioned. To answer the challenges that we face will not be simple, but if we align how we pay for care with how we diagnose and treat patients, we can reach our goal of high value care for every patient. As I close, to transform healthcare in America, to create high quality, patient-centered care that the nation can afford, we need to better deliver knowledge. What works? We need to create value, better outcomes at affordable costs in a system that invests in excellence. There is much that Mayo Clinic and our colleagues in healthcare can do on our own and collaboratively to drive innovation 
improve quality and control costs, but we can't do it alone. We need help from the policymakers. Washington must invest in healthcare innovation, particularly the NIH. We must create a payment system that recognizes the spectrum of care delivery and rewards quality and efficiency across that spectrum. We believe a starting point for payment reform is an overhaul of, Mayo, of Medicare's complicated payment structure. Fix the SGR. Americans want and deserve excellent health care. I'm a neurologist, not a pundit. But I suspect that history will review this period as a turning point in the transformation of American health care, a turnaround toward making high quality health care available and affordable to all. Thank you for allowing me to share our vision for transforming health care in America, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Noseworthy. You talked about research and how important it is. You mentioned the NIH there at the end. Tell us how your research efforts, particularly those you've just announced in the partnership with United Healthcare, might be affected by federal budget cuts. Obviously, the purpose of the research, as you talked about, is to cut costs, but it still costs money to do the research up front. So one example would be sequestration, a 2% cut translates to $47 million in one year to the Mayo Clinic. Half of that comes out of patient care, half of that comes out of research. That means we can't do as much research, we can't hire the young people to move that uh, agenda forward, and it puts us, uh, it, it slows us down. It's not a time to, re to restrain racehorses in America. Many people think the implementation of universal health care is significantly behind schedule with the administration behind on setting up health care exchanges. By the time the law takes effect fully, it's, uh, consumers in a lot of states will only have one choice. What are your thoughts on the implementation of universal health care? Well, it's been acknowledged that the government is running behind schedule. Um, they're doing what they can to catch up. It turns out this is more complex than they thought. That wasn't meant to be a political statement. Um, we're working with the government to help them understand how to do this, but it is behind. Um, it does put certain states at a disadvantage. It puts certain subsets of patients, citizens, at a disadvantage in certain states. It's not being developed equitably across the country. This is complex stuff. talked about the effect of Medicare cuts, mentioning $128 million in uh, less money coming in in the first year alone uh, based on what you're projecting. Tell us what that means for your medical staff, for patients. Put it in a, in a perspective that's more than dollars and cents. Well, I think any, uh, any of you who are in the business community recognize that if you're reimbursed less for every unit of work you do, uh, it puts huge pressure on the organization to be successful. And Mayo Clinic's not about making money. We're a not-for-profit, and every penny we make, we reinvest, we reinvest in research and education, in technology, in, in having the best staff in the world, recruiting and retaining the best people. Healthcare margins are very narrow. They're anywhere generally from 2 to 5 percent. If you have a 20 to 40 percent reduction in, in the work, in the payment for the work that you do, and close to 60, 60, 60 percent of the work we do at Mayo Clinic is in patients over the age of 65, um, there's a huge financial burden on the organization which drives innovation, sure. It drives efficiency, sure. But it also could easily slow the pace of research and as much as we're doing everything we can to avoid people losing their jobs, there gets to a point where it's very difficult to maintain the best workforce when your revenues are under such pressure. So it's, it's, this is a big deal. This is a serious, serious uh, situation for, for all of us. 
Would Mayo consider stopping accepting or limiting acceptance of Medicare patients? I've been asked that question repeatedly. We love to see Medicare patients. I think we do our best work with the elderly. They often have very complex conditions. They're often on an awful lot of medications and they need our help. Our integrated patient care model serves us well with these complex elderly patients. And a number of you have already spoken to me today at the reception about what we did for your relative, many of whom were in the Medicare age group. We would not want to turn away Medicare patients. Uh, we simply wouldn't want to do that. It's, we're, we're, we're a service organization. We have professionals who care deeply about the needs of the patients, and we do not want to turn patients away who we can help. It just gets to be very, very difficult if you can't get paid for that work. You talked about electronic medical records and the role those are playing in the future of delivery as well as in cutting costs. Questioner asks, how are you going about doing e-exchange of a patient's medical information both within Mayo and among um, outside medical organizations? How do you do that while ensuring against theft, tampering, and intrusion? That's a very important question. So sharing of patient information is complex. It's difficult. It must be done well. We all want our healthcare privacy protected. We do that extraordinarily well within the Mayo Clinic system. Across the country, that's difficult to share records, and across countries, is, is, it is as well. Mayo Clinic is one of the founding partners in something called the Care Connectivity Consortium. There are five other great groups that I could mention, Kaiser Permanente, Group Health, Geisinger, and others are in that group, trying to sort out how do we exchange medical information across the country with new systems that do that. We're working with the government to make that, make that happen. That's extraordinarily difficult, but we will get there. Does Mayo or any other large medical provider play any role in helping smaller providers who may refer their patients to you transition to electronic medical records? We're always available to help providers and patients with their needs. And every week, countless teams of practitioners, nursing schools, health organizations from around the world turn to Mayo Clinic for advice and for help. The numbers are such that we've now actually gone in part to creating about four sessions a year for folks that say, we want to come and learn from Mayo's models, and we have day-long symposiums to teach them to do that, to help with the efficiencies. But again, we would never turn away someone who, who we thought we could help. When you're on the Hill this afternoon, what issues will you be discussing with members of Congress? Fund excellence. <laughs> no, ser seriously, that's terribly, terribly important. We're now in the post-Affordable Care Act world. We're off to the first step. It's now important to recognize the second step, which is to understand the spectrum of care I talked about and the fact that there's a spectrum of quality, and it's now possible to measure that and to measure the cost if we simply go to reduce the budget and pay everybody less, essentially you've turned healthcare into a commodity, and I would argue that it isn't a commodity. That the very best should show the others how to do it better, and you need to have that competitive marketplace. And we can do that now with data, and I'm very excited about that. I think this is a breakthrough that really can help inform the government to do the right thing. I'll be at the Hill this afternoon. I was working with them yesterday. This is starting to catch on. It's just a difficult concept. The idea that you can measure health outcomes in the numerator and truly measure costs in the denominator and then call that a ratio and call that value, that was hard in school <laughs> to do that. It's hard, you know, that's hard to think about driving up the numerator, driving down the denominator. And what we've said is let's keep it simple. Let's create some rules around which that happens. And then let's create a, nu a numerical system, a transparent data system. And I always do this with my staff. I, I, I point to the perimeter of the ceiling and say, OK, pick your favorite hospital, your favorite group, whatever, and then pick what it is they're working on and what number are they trading at, if you will, much like the stock exchange. So knee replacement. Mayo Clinic, Duke, Cleveland Clinic, UCLA, 
uh, Georgetown, whatever, and you look and you say, boy, that group's ahead of that group. What are they doing that we could learn from? A competitive marketplace with transparent data that patients can see where their healthcare dollars are going and where they want to go for their care. That's what I'll be talking about. Where does prevention fit into your plan? The questioner says, how would you increase the value of prevention when it is not currently well measured? Well, we can measure prevention. It, the trouble is it takes a long time to measure it. That's one of the advantages of being around for 149 years is you have a, a, great, a great record system. And I mentioned the Olmsted County where we study the heck out of anybody who lives in that, in that region. And we know what works and we know the, the, the cost of that. And the, actually, the Affordable Care Act does a pretty good job of getting that preventative services, preventative services into the, onto, the front, onto the front line. That was a good step in that primary care uh, a part of the ACA. It's huge. And we know what Americans need to do. We just have to help them do it. In terms of controlling costs, data suggests that chronic diseases represent a disproportionate burden on the total health care spend. How should you as an industry, and Mayo in particular, approach chronic disease management in lower cost settings? It's a terrific question. It's a terrific question. A majority of the health care costs in the primary care, if you will, uh, spectrum of care is the management of chronic diseases. And now we have what we know what works. We can push that through in the knowledge delivery part to primary care physicians and nurses using protocols to manage the costs of care in a population. This is one of the best parts of the Affordable Care Act. And we can manage chronic diseases much better at lower cost by doing that. And we will see some benefit from that. We're very excited about the work we're doing. We call that population health management. It's a big deal. And the Affordable Care Act has actually moved that discussion in, in a very positive way, Angela. <clears throat> Looking locally to Rochester, can you explain to a, a national audience Mayo's current expansion plans and how you believe that, that will help improve medical care? Questioner asked, do you believe the Minnesota legislature will approve the infrastructure funding that Mayo has requested? I see that just for a second. I want to just see if I hit the. I want to hit the right points. Thank you. So, Rochester, Minnesota, is a town now of a little over 100,000 people. There are about 30,000 healthcare folks that live in this little town. It's a very special place, wonderful community, and a wonderful state. And they've had a relationship with the community that's been very strong, as I said, for 149 years, and Angela's uh, family hailed from there. Um, we've worked with the community for this last century, the 20th century, with 20-year plans of what's going to happen at Mayo Clinic. We have a very good relationship with the community. And essentially what this plan is all about is what is Mayo planning to do in the next five years and the next 20 years, if you will, working with the plan so the city and Mayo work together. If one looks back 20 years and one looks ahead 20 years and just sort of overlooks a little bit where the economy is in the moment because it is improving and it will, it will cycle, we expect that Mayo Clinic will invest three to three and a half billion dollars in Rochester in the next 20 years. We know from the private sector that there are probably, there's probably going to be something like $2 billion of private investment into Rochester into, in this destination medical community plan to develop a vibrant city that supports the international traffic, as I mentioned, 120, 137 countries coming there last year. So it's a livable city, both for the patients and the families who come with them and our remarkable staff. Now, Rochester is a small town. It doesn't have the tax base, because it's a small town, to build the sidewalks, bridges, and sewers that will be needed for this. Mayo Clinic is not asking for one penny from the state for Mayo Clinic. We're simply saying the tax base will grow with $6 billion over 20 years. 
we, we anticipate up to 40,000 new jobs, and all we're saying is, can Mayo Clinic get a piece of that tax revenue to pay for the sewers and the sidewalks and the bridges? It doesn't sound very elegant when you say it that way. But other states, and I won't mention them, are putting a ton of investment in outstanding marquee medical brands like Mayo Clinic to grow their facilities in order that they can become destination cities like Mayo Clinic has been for over 100 years. Mayo's grown every year. We know people will come. We anticipate they'll continue to come. We're simply asking, once the money is in and measured and the revenues are grown, can we take a portion of that to pay for the infrastructure in the town? I hope this happens. We've told the state we want to grow. We know Mayo Clinic will continue to grow. We want to grow in Minnesota. Mayo Clinic is the largest private employer in the state of Minnesota. We're responsible for 70,000 jobs, 140,000 jobs nationally, and $9.6 billion in revenue to the state of Minnesota. So we think they should just help us build some sidewalks and sewers and promise to do that. <laughs> because if we can't, we have to decide where we're going to invest. If we're going to invest $3 billion over the next 20 years, we just have to know that we're going to invest it in a place that will allow us to grow. We have tremendous support, bipartisan, bicameral, labor, commerce. We think, I, I think it should, I think, I hope it, I don't know whether it'll pass. I, I, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that on national television, I suppose, but, <laughs> but um, it should pass. It's the right thing for Minnesota. All boats will rise. The, the economy, we're good for the economy of Minnesota, and we hope that the legislature will, uh, will pass this, but we'll see. As you can imagine, there's a lot of questions on particular illnesses. Uh, we can't get to them all, but I um, wanted to ask one on Lyme disease, which had a lot of questions. Does Mayo Clinic have any plans to change its adherence to the CDC Lyme disease treatment and or testing guidelines? So Lyme disease is a tick-borne illness that many of you know about. It can be mild or asymptomatic, or it can be really quite severe and cause important complications and suffering for the patients who have Lyme disease. It's a complex disease to understand and to treat and to eradicate. Mayo Clinic sees patients with Lyme disease, and we believe we work with the Center for Disease Control, the CDC, and at the moment, they have guidelines in place how Lyme disease is best and most accurately and safely diagnosed, and we follow those. It's a two-step process where we do what's called an immune uh, enzyme test, and if it looks positive, we then go on to something called the immune blot test. Um, we believe that's the right way to go. We think they're the most knowledgeable in the industry, and we follow their guidelines. And if we or they feel that the guidelines should be changed, we will, we will change for our patients. But there's a, a, a large group of folks out there who um, think the guidelines are flawed. Uh, we think the guidelines are where we are today in today's knowledge. So we don't in intend to change those unless there's data to suggest that we should. And on mental health, a uh, questioner asks, what recommendations does Mayo have toward implementing Senator Paul Wellstone from Minnesota, of course, Mental Health Parity Act passed in 2008, but yet to be put into practice. Thanks, Angela. Mental health is a, is a huge problem in this country. It's underappreciated the degree of patient suffering and family suffering, as you all know. Um, I'm afraid I, I can't speak specifically to that policy. I, I just don't know enough about that particular act. Uh, we invest very heavily in research in psychiatric and behavioral disorders. We work very hard with our community to provide the best care we can to those who suffer from mental disease. Uh, and many of these folks are, very, are, are, um, uh, are very disadvantaged, and we do our very best to provide high quality, low cost care to them. Uh, but I'm afraid I, I just don't know enough about that policy, I'm sorry. Questioner asks about a recently released four-year Mayo study looking at breast cancer. The um, 
The questioner says the study will help find those who are most at risk for certain cancers, including breast cancer, and get the testing they need before the disease surfaces, and would like to know a little bit more about that study's results. Um, I'm sorry. I, I'm a neurologist and a CEO. Uh, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but I don't know everything, and I don't know that specific study, uh, so I'll have to uh, defer that question to our, our team here to try to get the right answer for that patient. I will say that cancer prediction and prevention and treatment is an area of great interest at Mayo Clinic, and there is reason for great excitement about the new biology as we understand more about the genetics and genomics of cancer both for the patients and the tumors that grow in patients, and that dictates how we treat our patients so that they get individually tailored treatment to best benefit. One little story I might just tell you for those of you who haven't followed this. Uh, we had an example last uh, week with an indiv we have individualized medicine, which is this business about what do your genes tell you about your health and what do your genes tell you about how you're gonna respond to a certain treatment. We had a patient with a young woman with breast cancer. She's had multiple treatments and has responded and then failed and relapsed, responded and failed and then relapsed. She came to the individualized medicine clinic at Mayo Clinic, which is the first clinic of its type in the country. We did a genomic sequence on her and on her tumor, and we found that her tumor, although it's a breast tumor and a recurrent severe advanced breast tumor, it shares characteristics in a genetic fingerprint of a lung cancer, not a breast cancer. And so we're treating her now with treatment that we know works in lung cancer. So again, this is where we're advancing in terms of individualized medicine and individualizing our care. Uh, and that's very exciting. We are almost out of time, but before asking the last question, we've got a couple of housekeeping matters to take care of. First of all, I'd like to remind you of our upcoming luncheon speakers. On April 12th, this Friday, Ken Burns, documentary filmmaker, will discuss his new documentary, The Central Park Five. On April 15th, Olafur Grimson, the president of Iceland, will discuss the global race for resources in the Arctic. And on April 17th, we will host Gil Kurlikowski, the Director of the Office of National Drug Control Policy. Second, I would like to present our guest with the traditional National Press Club coffee mug. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate you coming today, and we have one last question for you. Questioner says, how does the Mayo Clinic attract so many excellent physicians from New York City, San Francisco, Chicago, et cetera, to Rochester, Minnesota? What, <laughs> what, what, what is the pitch you make to them, and what is the success rate? All right, time for a little humor. <clears throat> I had a friend of mine come and visit me when I was chair of the Department of Neurology, and he was from New York City. And he said, how can you stand it here? He's my guest, how can you stand here? And I said, well, you get a warm coat and a hat and mitts. He goes, no, no, no. He said, there's no tension. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He said, in New York, we're always trying to beat the other hospital, take over their medical school, whatever, whatever. He said, everybody gets along here. And I said, well, we spend our time fighting disease, I guess, it just, it, it just depends on what you wanna do, so. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Noseworthy. Thank you all for coming today. I'd also like to thank the National Press Club staff, including its Journalism Institute and Broadcast Center, for helping organize today's event. Finally, here's a reminder that you can find out more information about the National Press Club, including about becoming a member on our website. And if you'd like a copy of today's program, please check that out at www.press.org. Thank you. We are adjourned. The goal is to extend the clinic's mission to serve new populations, providing care through more efficient delivery and increasing the personalization and immediacy of health care for all people. In Minnesota, the clinic's plans raised eyebrows when they announced they were 
going to ask for infrastructure funding and ask the state to help out with $585 million of taxpayer money. The idea is that the infrastructure will benefit the facilities and help bring more revenue to the state as it conveys more patients. The clinic argues that enhancements will bring more revenue and it's entitled to some of the money in return. Despite the eye-popping number in a state that struggled with finances in recent years, the plan has won endorsement of much in the Minnesota media and the support of Rochester lawmakers. The clinic is also accelerating the transition of research in patient care and was the first facility approved by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration to produce and administer choline C11 injections, which help detect recurrent prostate cancer earlier, providing patients with more immediate access to new individualized and targeted treatments. The Mayo served as Chairman of the Department of Neurology, Medical Director of the Department of Development, and Vice Chairman of the Mayo Clinic Rochester Executive Board. He is also a professor in the Department of Neurology and continues to practice medicine and consult with patients. His specialty is multiple sclerosis, and he has spent more than two decades designing and conducting controlled clinical trials. Dr. Noseworthy also is the author of more than 150 research papers, chapters, editorials, and several books. He has served as editor-in-chief for Neurology, the official journal of the American Academy of Neurology. Born in Melrose, Massachusetts, Dr. Noseworthy received his medical degree from Dalhousie University in Canada. Peers say he has an excellent understanding of differing healthcare delivery systems and priorities because he has lived in both Canada and the United States. And they also say that as the son of a minister, he has developed values that are altruistic and highly ethical. During his tenure as CEO, Dr. Noseworthy and his leadership team developed a strategic plan designed to ensure the Mayo Clinic remains a trusted resource for patients amid a rapidly changing healthcare environment. And currently, the head of the National Cable and Telecommunication Association, Carolyn Block, editor with, the, with Federal Telemedicine News, Cynthia Carter, President and CEO, FDA News, and Brenda Crane, Director, Media and Editorial for the American Medical Association. <laughs> Our guest today runs a place with such name recognition that it's known simply as The Clinic. The Mayo Clinic is a not-for-profit health care system dedicated to medical care, research, and education. The clinic has more than 61,000 employees, operates in six states, and is based in the city of Rochester in the great state of Minnesota. Every year, more than a million people from every state in the U.S. and nearly 150 countries come to the Mayo Clinic to receive care. Dr. John H. Noseworthy is its president and chief executive officer. Dr. Noseworthy joined the Mayo Clinic in 1990. Prior to his current appointment, he served Good afternoon, and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Angela Greiling Keen. I'm a reporter for Bloomberg News, and I'm the 106th president of the National Press Club. We are the world's leading professional organization for journalists, committed to our profession's future through programming with events such as this while fostering a free press worldwide. For more information about the Press Club, please visit our website at press.org to donate to programs offered through our National Press Club Journalism Institute to the public. Please visit www.press.org backslash institute. On behalf of our members worldwide, I'd like to welcome our speaker and those of you in our audience today. Our head table includes guests of our speaker as well as working journalists who are club members. If you hear applause in our audience today, we'd note that members of the general public are also attending, so it's not necessarily evidence of a lack of journalistic objectivity. <laughs> I'd like to welcome our C-SPAN and public radio audiences as well. Our luncheons are featured on our weekly member-produced podcast from the National Press Club, available on iTunes. You can follow the action today on Twitter using the hashtag NPCLunch. After our guest speech concludes, we'll have question and answer period. I will ask as many questions as time permits. Now it's time to introduce our head table guests. I'd ask each of you to stand up briefly as your name is announced. From your right, Devin Henry, Washington correspondent for MinPost. Amy Morris, Morning Drive anchor for WNEW Radio, CBS's DC affiliate. 
Jessica Zygmunt, Washington Bureau Chief for Modern Healthcare. Marlene Malik, President, Friends of Cancer Research. Deidre Henderson, a Program Officer with the Roundtable on Value and Science-Driven Healthcare at the Institute of Medicine. His Excellency, Rodolf Bekink of the Netherlands. Skipping over the podium, and Matt Malnarchek, President of the Advocatus Group and the Speakers Committee member who organized today's event. Thank you, Matt. Skipping over our speaker for a moment, Michael Powell, a Mayo Clinic trustee, a former FCC chairman,